Norwich Theatre Talks. My name is Stephen Crocker and I'm Chief Executive and Creative Director of Norwich Theatre and it's lovely to be back here at Podcast Corner at Norwich Playhouse, complete with the sound of merrymaking in the bar and some subtle 80s music proving to you that we're live. This episode comes to you on World Theatre Day and across it we're going to be exploring the power of theatre and later meeting our creative community's producer, Mish Montague. But first, I'm delighted to welcome one of the country's most popular entertainers, the showman himself, Darren Brown. Darren, welcome back to Norwich. Uh, thank you. <laughs> this is very, very exciting. It's the very end of a, a 350-date tour. I've been doing this for over a year, and it, we're finishing here, and it's very exciting. Well, it's incredible for us, because believe it or not, this is the very last of our rescheduled shows um, because yeah. of COVID. So it feels like with you, we're sort of closing a chapter and put that behind us. And um, it's, also, it's also lovely. Thank you very much for extending your tour so that you can oh, fit this in for us. A pleasure. And thank you to these people that are coming that have, <laughs> have had their show delayed so many times and have stuck with it and had their tickets delayed and <laughs> postponed to the next one. And then I, yeah, it was all going fine until I got there. I then got COVID <laughs> and delayed it one more time. But finally, it's extremely good to be here. Very nice that it's Norwich to come to after a West End run, given that it could be anywhere. Absolutely. To actually come somewhere that's just fantastic. I, I really like that. A West End run, then one week, one week in Norwich. It's I a party. Think. It's like a party week. It's, yeah. so nice. it's so lovely being on tour anyway. And to be somewhere that's... Um, there, are, there are a few highlights on a tour. Norwich is always one of them. There's a few others. Bristol is lovely and um, Edinburgh. There's like a few cities that always just sort of are great to be in. So it's a proper treat almost worth getting COVID for to make it happen this way around. <laughs> but you... And nice to be talking to you before, you know, your guests finally just disappear behind the uh, cheese plant or uh, absolutely. devil's ivy or whatever it is. Uh, every episode this plant grows closer just to a little my head. Closer. Is, yeah. This is a horticultural podcast in fact. <laughs> um, but you've toured extensively. I mean your commitment to getting out around the country is is just incredible and I was lucky enough to see the show last night and that, and that really, really shows you, you the, the, the sort of love and, and warmth in oh, the room nice. and all those audiences that kind of stayed over four reschedules they actually yeah. booked their tickets four years ago yeah. it, 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 you know you've got that amazing rapport because you've been creating work for such a long time and I guess my first question on World Theatre Today people often ask you kind of how you do the show but my, my question is more about how do you conceive the content of the show where, where does it start for you well, there's three of us that make the show. There's an uh, actor called Andy Nyman and a, uh, a guy called Andrew O'Connor who used to be um, a comic and impressionist back in the sort of 80s and now he produces. And um, the three of us have always made the TV and the stage shows together. So we write the thing together and then those two direct. Uh, and I suppose it's up to me to be the driving force behind it, but I, I wouldn't want to do it on my own. So there's a, it's a proper collaborative effort, but normally the heart of the show will come from what I find interesting or valuable or just important at the time. And um, often I'm book writing around the same time. And the things that I write about are life related, not magic related. So I'm normally taking those things that I find valuable in life and then trying to bring them into yeah. the show. Ma ma magic is a it's the quickest, most fraudulent route to impressing people. So, you know, there's something inherently very childish about it, um, if you want to call what I do magic. It's definitely got one foot in that. So a, a challenge for me has always been to make something grown up and honest out of something that's kind of childish and, and dishonest. Um, so because of that, I, try, I always try and make the shows about something other than just, you know, how did, how did he do that? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it'll start often with that, a kind of a sense of, well, this is what I think the show should be about. The current show is about how the things in life that feel isolating are actually like when life goes badly and we feel like we've failed or whatever, are actually tend to be the things that join us together. Yeah. Because we all share in those experiences. Um, and other ideas that follow on from that. So there was a heart to this show. Um, mm. And then we have a, about a month of talking about it and coming up with ideas and routines, for want of a better word, but they tend to start with a sort of... Um, a theatrical image or, a, or a, a, an idea rather than a 
rather than a trick that we found yeah, yeah. Or, or have done before, or, or least of all a method, a way of doing something. That's the worst place to mm. begin from. So we, we have these ideas for types of things, and then there are often ideas for magic routines that are floating around that we haven't done. Um, so we kind of maybe revisit those, and, 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 and somehow we get a shape. And then after about a month of that, we then have another month in a rehearsal room, trying to get it on its feet and finding the language for it and how everything fits together. But it's a weird one because with my shows in particular, I don't, until I have a thousand people sat there, I just, I don't know whether some of it will work. Mm. So the previous show, or a couple of back now, I suppose called Miracle, mm. the whole of the second half was faith healing. And until I've got an audience and see how they respond to it, because in a way, it's one thing if you're going to see a faith healer and you believe in that stuff, That's but if, right. if they're like me and are sceptical and aren't psychologically prepared for it, didn't know if it was going to work. So those first few shows are a big part of the process of still... I mean, as with any play, of course, it would have previews, but I think particularly with this one, uh, because you just don't know how things will work out. So that's all part of the creative process as well. So it's a couple of months of writing and then rehearsing and then just seeing if it even comes together when it's yeah, in real life. That's right, because I, I was watching the show last night and, and I, I was just puzzling and asking that question of myself because... I could hear you, actually. I was going to ask you to be quiet. <laughs> try to get on with the show. I can't catch a frisbee, though, unfortunately. Yeah. But I was just... You know, the audience are so integral to the show. Yeah. Without them, the, the show simply wouldn't it work, exist, yeah. would it? They are your cast. And yeah. that must be, you know, somewhat scary because you've a different cast... Every, Every night. night. Of well, show. It's all I'm used to, of course, so yeah. I love it. Because for me, it... Um, and obviously, with a 350-date tour, your experience of it can sort of dip and rise a little. But generally, the huge positive of that is I can't ever just go out and, and repeat the same show. No. It's a lovely thing about you're trying to recreate something and not repeat it every night. And partly that's stuff I just find within myself for my own performance, so hopefully it feels like I'm saying all these things for the first time, but what really helps is you're just so on your toes, because yeah, people yeah, yeah. are getting involved, and although I'm doing maybe the same gag or the same thing as I did the night before, I'm, I'm, I'm in order to make the thing work, <laughs> I have to really um, pay very close attention to who's up on stage with me, and that, that's a really nice thing, and it, it, sometimes it means, you know, the fates collide in such a way that it feels like a bad night, but it doesn't necessarily mean the audience have not enjoyed no, it. It no. just means that I'm mentally comparing it to the night before when everything was a bit smoother or whatever. But um, but uh, it just means you never... You, I, I never get the same show, show twice, which is uh, lovely, even if it's just for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a positive. You talked about magic a second ago and then about the shows being about you. Now, I've, I've read a few of your books and, and early in your writing career, yeah. you were particularly writing about magic, yeah. weren't you? And you've evolved yeah. as a writer to, to talking much more broadly. Has, has that kind of informed your theatre making as you totally. make the shows? Have, yeah. have you evolved over, over that time? Something, sometimes people, the most in, inspiring things come from things that you've half half thought but never really found the language for and then somebody says something one day and you go oh yes that and my manager said a few years ago to me that um he said i was very unusual in the world of magicians of whom he's known a lot in that i don't make the show about myself and i hadn't really thought about that and i thought oh that sounds nice and then the more i thought about it i thought well, actually that is that is something that's Im important because if you make the show about yourself well, first of all, a any job you do only gets better if you don't make it about yourself, mm. right? I think, I think any job would be the same. If you're a teacher and you just you only care about how you're admired as a teacher, you're not going to be as good a teacher as you are if you care about your students. And if you're an actor on stage caring about yourself and your own performance more than the text or whatever it is you're trying to serve, then you're not going to do as good a job. So I, uh, after he said that, then it became a bit more of a conscious driving force. So I... The, the, the easy thing with magic is to make it about yourself and how am I doing this thing or I have mm. this power or what, whatever it is. But um, A, I'm not that interesting and B, it's, not, <laughs> it's just not a very... Um, it's, I think it's why magicians tend to have quite short shelf lives generally because mm. we, we know their posturing and yeah. all the stuff that's really interesting about magic they can't talk about because that's the stuff you keep seeing. Yeah. So um, where do you go? So I've always just... I, I, maybe I've just sort of grown out of the urge to 
impress in that way that I used to have. And now I do think there's, you know, if you watch, if you watch a magic trick and it fools you in a good way, what you've, what you've been shown is that your story of the world doesn't quite match up to reality. That's right, yeah. There's mm. other stuff going on that you've missed. And that's a really important thing in life to get, isn't it? You know, we have this infinite data source coming at us. We can only edit and delete and turn it into some sort of narrative so we can navigate through the world. Um, but it's, there's, there's stuff we're missing all the time. Um, and, you know, that's about how we form stories and so on. And, and I think that's all, even something as silly and childish as magic, um, I think can serve that which is uh, important, and that's about so much more than how a magician is doing their tricks. Yeah, and and that's what I was sensing last night because, mm. of course, I was glued to watching what you were doing on stage. But mm. for me, it, it's a little bit like when I go to our pantomime every year. It's so much about watching goes watching yeah. what goes on around you and how people are experiencing yeah. the show. Yeah. And I was thinking exactly the same thing around magic. For some, there is real joy and happiness in not knowing how it's done. Yeah. But you sort of hint towards it for people because those people find joy in finding it out. And it's playing yeah. at those different levels, isn't it? I hope so. And I, I hope, yes, obviously there's always going to be the level of how is that thing possible or whatever, which is the fun of it, hopefully, and the amazement of it and the thing that um, is my job to, to bring. But ultimately, I just... I try and I try to make it about something in its heart that is different, and I think there's um, hopefully a sense of sort of fellow feeling or something that comes from from this show because you know that's really what it's about. And you I, you know we do sit and think, what are people going to take away from this show? And what when they leave, how should they feel different from before? And why is everything in the show? Why is it there? In the same way, if you're writing a scene in a play or a screenplay or whatever, every every scene would have a good reason for being there, otherwise it just shouldn't be there. Yeah, yeah. And, um, all of that, I think, is uh, uh, is so important. They're not, they're not really a theatre audience that come and see the show. I did the show in Liverpool the other year, and there's a guy with a pizza in the, in the yeah. front row. Yeah. And I think, <laughs> so, it. Um, so it's also quite nice to... Uh, a, that's lovely to bring people in that don't feel like traditional theatre audiences, um, but also to, it's to still try and hit them with the the stuff of theatre that makes theatre interesting and effective and worthwhile as opposed to just, as I say, somebody somebody doing clever tricks. That's right. It's, it's that wow factor, isn't it? That feeling you only get when you're sat in a theatre and, and you're feeling it mm. with other people. And, you know, I often... I often get people talk to me about shows they've seen and they, they like it, they don't like it. But actually, that's a sign of a good show if it gets you talking yeah, afterwards. Yeah, yeah. And I absolutely agree. Your audiences, you know, are, are, don't come to us generally to other shows. And yeah. that's an amazing opportunity yeah. for the whole theatre industry, actually, yeah. if you're bringing people in for the first time. But I've never kind of been at a show where you hear more conversation in the interval because yes, it just stimulates yeah. that. And, you know, there's that, that sort of sense of anticipation in, in the audience as to, you know, those people that desperately want to be part of the show and those that really, really yeah. kind of don't. There's, there's a bit in the show you'll, you'll be aware of when um, I'm just sort of finishing a card trick and no one in the audience is paying any attention. They're all talking yeah. with each other about what has or hasn't just happened. And I'm just... I'm carrying on with this thing and realised really early on in the tour, okay, no one's paying any attention now at this point in the show. And it's kind of lovely. It's lovely that there's this big group conversation happening. Um, so, yeah it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a lovely thing. The other thing that I've loved, having seen several of your shows, is it's a real homage to the great entertainers of history, the great illusionists mm. and hypnotists and telepathists, isn't it? Yeah. Is, is that really... Because you say magic is silly, but you're really respectful to that great tradition. Is that really Im important in making the show? What, what's helpful, what I found really helpful with um, dipping into the history of it is not, I'm, I'm not particularly interested in presenting the history of magic. I don't really even know a huge <laughs> amount about it. There are people that know far more about it than me. But what it's allowed me to do over the years is to present a... So, like, you know, I, I obviously don't pretend to be psychic, but I could recreate the act yeah. of an old psychic act, you know, and, and um, that would then allow me to do something that's sort of impossible and out of my, you know, sort of, out of the story of what I want the audience to go away believing I can actually do. It sort of puts quotation marks around the whole thing. I can say, these people did this, they were fakes, and I'll do it for you now. And yeah. then suddenly there's, it gives me license to 
have all the fun of that without the problem of, oh, I don't want people actually going away thinking I'm, I'm uh, psychic or whatever. So I've, I've often done it, but the reason why I've done it is, and sometimes I've completely invented the historical things yeah, yeah. that I'm creating, <laughs> as well, that I'm referring to. So it, it, to me, it, also, it serves the show. It serves that particular show because it provides us a, 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 a layer or something or a reason for doing it or permission to sort of do it. or uh, So it's all about what adds to that show and sometimes understanding that it's got a historical root, even if that's, whether that's genuine or fictitious or somewhere between the two, which is always a fun place to be. Uh, I think that can... Um, it just changes the tone, doesn't it? It will just yeah. change the tone of the show, and yeah. it's, it's um, an interesting I'm, thing to I'm be I'm imagining a world a hundred years from now where somebody <laughs> is paying homage to I'd Darren Brown delighted. in I'd be delighted. AI and bots and all that. Yeah, Can yeah. you imagine that, that world? It's hard to imagine what magic will be in a hundred years' time. There's a, a, I think yeah. Arthur C. Clarke or someone made the point that magic is indistinguishable from insufficiently understood technology or it's something like that you know that whatever we're sort of on the verge of and half understanding is sort of our form of uh, our form of magic and um, me leaning into the psychological world is sort of of our moment it'll probably be mm. quantum uh, themed at some <laughs> point and a while back it was you know electricity was the big thing or yeah, yeah, uh, you yeah. know there's this it's whatever that whatever we feel we're on the fringes of provides such a rich um uh, yeah, sort of, you know, breeding ground for magical themes. Absolutely. I, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit whilst we're together about happiness as well, which oh, yeah. of course you, you, you've written about because yeah. one of the things that <clears throat> I, I've thought about a lot, and it prompted me during COVID, it's mm. exactly what we were talking about. I was, it just suddenly dawned on me when theatres closed during mm. COVID, yes, we'd lost access to buildings, mm. but we'd lost access to those creative mm. collective experiences mm. that we, we kind of all need in our lives, mm. don't we, is to know mm. there's comfort in knowing that the person next to you is feeling the same yeah. thing yeah. as you. And and I've I, I've loved what you've written about happiness and, you know, that uh, happiness being a, a, a state of mind. Does, does that go into your, your theatre making? Yes, yes, it will. And so, like in this in this particular show, as I said, there is a there is a theme that runs through it of the things that tend to make us feel most isolated in life, i.e., when when it's not going well, are often the very things that bring us together. And I start off with one of those um, horoscopes. Yes, that's that right. we all know. You could probably read any horoscope to anybody, and they'd probably make it fit and say, "Oh, that's yes, that's quite accurate." Um, and then we kind of dismiss them as just nonsense. But actually, there's something quite valuable that they offer, which is, oh yes, we're all sharing in very similar types of experiences. We all suffer from similar insecurities, and that's why those things work, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I think that the, the, that's a, that is a big part of what theatre can be about. It isn't necessarily what it's about. I mean, if a, you know, if a play doesn't <laughs> work for you at all, it's not going to really transport you. It might not you anyway. necessarily make you happy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it might not. But there is, you know, we used to sit around, our ancestors used to sit around campfires and lose themselves, be transported by storytelling that was this, they were probably high at the time, and there was this <laughs> communal experience of the stories of the tribe and the, the rights of the tribe being sort of played out in some sort of dramatic storytelling form, and people would you know, sit in the dark and stare at the light and lose themselves in that. And I think theatre is, it's the, it's the sort of, all we've got left of that, uh, yeah. that sort of urge. Yeah. It's this sort of shared dream thing. Where, and whether you're looking at Hamlet or Shrek, you are seeing a hero struggle with stuff. Yeah. And when you relate to that stuff yourself, which probably a good drama is going to make sure that you do, and you're sharing that with the person next to you and the person next to them, and you're sat in the dark and losing yourself in this other person's story. Um, I think that's a really, uh, it's a really important thing. And there's not exactly about happiness, because mm. happiness just suggests a sort of a mood. But it is about, um, it's about a certain sort of uh, well-being, isn't it? Or a certain that's sort of right. flourishing. There's, there's, a, yeah. there's a, a, a deeper thing that something like theatre 
or movies, or the trouble yeah. with movies, they're increasingly becoming um, insular and domestic experiences and not so shared, but there is something in sharing in a story as an audience that is resonant, uh, which I think is very powerful. Magic, of course, is terrible, terrible dramatically. If you can click your fingers and make anything happen, then there's no drama in that. Yeah. So, um, uh, and Teller, the, the Penn and Teller, the yeah, yeah. wonderful American duo, and, and Teller, is, Teller has written a lot about this, that, you know, we... If you can click your fingers and make anything happen, you're, you're a god figure, and god figures have no, are of no dramatic interest in stories. Heroes are, so yeah, that's actually right. <clears throat> introducing struggle, and, and yeah. you know, heroes, they'll aim for one spot, but probably they've ended up somewhere else by the end of the story. And, yeah. and, and this is why in my own TV work, I've moved from being the guy doing the tricks yeah. to someone in the background, so then you're watching members of the public go through these sort of elaborate set up things because now you're watching a, a dramatic story play out which I just think is more that, interesting. That That's right isn't it and it, it's it is it's the other thing I, I, I go back to Panto mm. again because the, in our we did a we did a big Panto every year as lots of people know and we asked the question of audiences this year did it make you feel happier mm. and 80 percent of them identified yes yeah, immediately yeah, yeah. and I think it is that following somebody's story that relatability yeah. kind of gives you a sort of validity for what you're going through to some degree, yeah. doesn't Obviously it? Obviously it depends on the story, because yeah, it can yeah, be a very yeah. sad story, yeah. it? but, but I, think, I think there is, I think whoever you see or whatever you see on stage, what you actually want to do is connect with a human being. I think that's, that's why right. we're all there. And whether they're singing or acting or doing magic or dancing or whatever it is, you want to feel a, a, a human connection, yeah. um, which again is always the starting point for my shows, and I'm aware that magic is the enemy of that. I get, yeah. it, it, you have to fight against that in order to, um, uh, to, to, to keep that at, you know, at the heart of the experience. So I, I think, um, yeah, and it's, it's, not, it's not about happiness in a glitzy sense. It's just, it's the, it's the thing that is important. And then on top of all that, the things that only theatre can provide. The other, my other starting point is always, you know, I've got 2,000 people stuck in a room with me. What, what can I <laughs> What can I do with, with that? Like, I've kind yeah. of got license to do anything, yeah, really. Yeah. So that's really fun. I'm trying to come up with things that would only exist in a room of that number of people, yeah. as opposed to I'm just sitting watching a play that I could watch on a TV screen. And, and the, involve people in a very visceral, you know, and emotional way. I think all that's hugely exciting too and I think they're more interesting than just happiness but they're That's really important right. and they're definitely allied to yeah and, and with your shows in particular again I saw it last night such a unique collection of people I and mean, the age range of people coming to yeah, your shows is yeah. like nothing else that, that's yeah. just kind of having a bigger canvas to work on for you I mean there was a really special moment if you don't mind me sharing around a parent and son yeah, that, that yeah. we met last night yeah and, you know that that's 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 that is unique that's that's kind of like panto again you know, yeah. it's got that people feel they can come together and have that unique experience yes yeah, so that's very nice and I've noticed it because there was a bit of a gap with Covid and then a gap with um I did a show on Broadway as well, and then off Broadway before that. So it's actually been quite a while since I did a mm. show in the UK, and I've definitely noticed this. It's essentially, I think, a jump up in age because the younger kids aren't watching as much TV, so they don't, and their experience of TV and entertainment is now so sort of dispersed um, that they don't really know me, but the parents do. So I've, yeah. I've realised, and I hadn't noticed this before, so it's definitely a. It was a bit of a kind of a, oh, a moment of, right, okay, I'm growing up, getting older, of parents <laughs> introducing me to their teenage children who didn't, didn't yeah. know me from Adam. Um, it was the last time I looked, I was very much a young person's <laughs> entertainer. Their parents <laughs> oh, might not have known oh, me. No. So that's kind of interesting. I'm not too whether that's happened. But yeah, it does mean that looking out, looking out of the audience is a proper, it's a proper mixed um, group, which is, um, is lovely and actually, again, serves the show because there's, I can do things in the show that are to do with age and growing up. This is very much a show, I'm 52 just, and this is very much a show that only makes sense to do at 52. It wouldn't have made any sense to do it when I was 30. And it's, mm. that's nice, then it's nice if your audience isn't in a totally different yeah. universe age-wise. And then uh, my, my, my sort of final thing I wanted to talk to you about is your kind of almost the becoming, if you don't mind me saying, the, the Renaissance man, as well as making shows mm -hmm. for the stage, you write uh, and you paint. That, mm. that, that's a range of creative mm. outlets and that must be fascinating to kind of blend that. Is, is, is that your 
to happiness, those different uh, outlets? Um, it does help, yeah. I do find myself, if I'm not, if I'm not engaged, I, mean, I think it's probably a very common experience if they've done something like a tour or finished a creative project, to then, if you find yourself with nothing to do, mm. which you think is going to be lovely, you actually yeah, yeah. get irritable. <laughs> and yeah, you yeah. do. I, I, I wrote the book on happiness and then I was giving a little mm. sort of talking tour with it feeling really miserable, I don't know why, and I felt like a hypocrite going out talking about how to be a little happier whilst feeling miserable, and I realised it's because I'd finished the book. Um, there had been this amazing, rewarding engagement for, you know, three years, as it turned out, and uh, likewise with this, I know I'll, 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 um, I'll miss it. So those, those other things I do are very helpful. I like... We find meaning in life by losing ourselves in something bigger, yeah. right? You find yeah, something yeah. that's bigger than you, and you, yeah. you just throw yourself into that thing, so... All those things do that for me, um, and uh, yeah, they do make me happy. And also, it's a very um, doing a show is quite a public sort of job, and the the things that I really then love alongside that are very much the opposite. Writing and painting, all those things are quite private things, so they're really um, they feel very nourishing. Yeah. Uh, Darren, it's been lovely to talk to you on World Theatre today, and thank you for coming back to Norwich. And dare I say, just thank you for continuing to make theatre in such an extraordinary way. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you again to the audiences that have allowed themselves to be delayed and delayed and let their tickets come forward again and again. And thank you very much for coming, and thank you for having me. welcoming large-scale shows touring around the country to Norwich theatres venues we are really really proud of the work that we originate and co-originate right here in Norwich and particularly on World Theatre Day celebrating the creativity amongst our own communities so my next guest is Mish Montague who's our creative communities producer and Mish tell us a little bit about your role and some of the projects that you work on? I'd love to. So um, maybe it's easier if I divide my role into two to explain. Yeah. My first job is to support community projects. Uh, for example, we start rehearsals next week with a community project uh, linked to the Royal Shakespeare Company's Julius Caesar. Yeah. And that community of people that we have will be a part of their tour when they come to Norwich in June. The second part of my job is, I suppose, I explore new avenues for Norwich Theatre. Mm. So I will talk to individuals, I will go out to people in the local communities, and I will see how we might be able to support them creatively. Um, and then I suppose my job is to react to those conversations that we've had. Um, I will try and design a project uh, that the community has asked for, that they would like a voice about. And then comes the fun bit for me. So <laughs> I go into the studio and I will be with a new community of theatre makers um, and see where that journey takes us all. Yeah, and, and that's... That's the exciting bit, as you say, isn't it? And I think often some people might think when, when we do projects like mm. this that we, we, we come up with a concept and this yeah. is what we're going to do. We go, there you go. But actually, you, you absolutely pioneer an approach of co-creation, don't absolutely. you? Absolutely. That's, that's the whole part of my role with Norwich Theatre. So we will, we will take a, a new group of theatre makers we will offer them a safe space um, and 
we will support their exploring of their voices, of what they want to talk about, mm. any issues that they want to talk about, and they will, and then they will build. I suppose they build a a bold, inclusive, mm. definitely um, new piece of theatre. But like you say, I think it's really important to say that the words, the material that's built on, are their voices, <laughs> their visions, and. But I, I suppose it's their wisdoms as well, because they have a wisdom about their community that we don't have. Mm -hmm. Nothing is scripted, and, and we don't push any subject onto them whatsoever. No. And, and <clears throat> you mentioned a really important term there, which is safe space, because I, I, I've been privileged to watch you work and, and see what comes out of that process. And people are sharing in an incredible way, aren't they? And we, we've all got our own story, yeah. but actually some of your work goes to quite moving and in incredible stories. I'm thinking some of the work you do with Theatre of Sanctuary in particular. So, Stephen, Theatre of Sanctuary has been the most amazing project. So we've, I've just finished my first project with them. Mm called Migration Patterns. And we have a group of migrants, refugees and asylum seekers who have only spent eight weeks with us, but have trusted us fully. And I think, you know, we often talk about the magic of theatre. Mm, yeah. and, and it kind of, the magic of theatre feels intangible really, mm. but, but it fills our space. So for example, just, just to share a little bit, we have a Turkish family who have only been in this country for four months. They arrived here to flee from violence and to have a voice. Mm. They, they, and they have a 14-month-old daughter who they want to grow up uh, with a voice. Um, and the day after the first earthquake in Turkey, they chose to come to a workshop not only did they choose to come to a workshop, they specifically thanked us for giving them a space of sanctuary. Mm. And they continued to create a piece of theatre. And they said it, it was really important for them to document their journey creatively. Mm. So that kind of says everything <clears throat> about what we're doing. Yeah, uh, and there is that magic. We, I, I was lucky to talk to Darren Brown, a magician, of course. earlier yeah. on a, a, around this, and, and that's it in its literal sense. Yeah. But what we were talking about was just that moment of people finding their own joy and moment of happiness. And the, 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 the groups you work with through Theatre of Sanctuary, I think we acknowledge we, we can't right wrongs that have happened no. in their story, but platforming and providing that space is giving them an outlet, isn't it? it and is. providing ha happiness. Yeah, and I think we, uh, the safety um, just comes from the trust that's mm. built. And I, I'm not quite sure how that's built. I don't know whether it's that I never ask questions. I don't inquire. There's never any subtext at this point. We're just open to giving them the space to let them speak. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, it's in, it's incredible, and and the happiness. I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure if I'd use the word happiness, mm. but I'm amazed that, for example, we've we've started a piece of physical theatre, and every moment we've just got short moments, but every moment reflects the journey of one of our participants, and they're talking about really powerful things like, for example, we have one participant who, whose moment is about, uh, she woke up one morning uh, to the sound of sirens and her dad said, you have 30 minutes mm. to collect your belongings, to uh, say goodbye to the home and to get to the border. And then he was staying in the Ukraine to fight. Um, so we're, we're, we're creating and developing those moments. But at the same time, the room is joyous. Joy. And, and, and joy. I think it's joy yeah. for me. I, I don't think it's so much happiness, but it's, it, the room is filled with joy and smiles. Yeah. Although they're talking about harrowing experiences. It, it is 
moments of joy, isn't yeah. it? And and often I think we've seen through the incredible work that, you, that you, you've been pioneering with us, that actually providing that platform, somebody externalising their story yeah. is part of a process. And theatre provides that in a, in a really special way, no, absolutely. doesn't it? And, and you know, we're not, not at that stage yet, but if we manage to get to the stage where we could share the work, yeah. then then that connects us in so many ways to other people in the city. It's inspiring, compassion, all those things. So their journeys just continue. Yeah. yeah. And of course, the, the other strand of work that, that you're very much leading and involved in for us bring, brings people together around something that's on all of our minds at the moment, doesn't it? Which is climate and climate stories and yes. we talked a lot about this season of work we, we've done the creative matter sure. season for a number of years haven't we yeah. and it's a big undertaking for us and we've not done it lightly to to think about climate action yeah i, I was quite scared about taking it <laughs> yeah. on thinking do me I, too. No, seriously me do too. i know, know enough about it how can i lead and support a room without being an authority on something mm. so under the theater makers uh, banner we we have got uh, we've got what we call uh, listen to the landscape which is just an open invitation for people to come once a week um, every afternoon mm. uh, and to talk about or to create their own pieces of theater around what they hear on the landscape mm. so that could be a soundscape that they put together Yep. It could be visual work, but I think, again, the important thing is that we are listening yep. to other people. Yep. Under that umbrella of our uh, stories, our climate stories, we also have the second project of our next generation, which is our 18 to 25 year old group. Mm -hmm. And we are hoping that they lead more on activism. So, for example, we will be asking them, we will be giving them a stimulus every week. And then they will be going out with their mobile phones and recording themselves. And then we will be putting that film footage together. Theatre of Sanctuary mm. have also agreed to work on monologues. So they're talking about migration um, in terms of climate. Mm. Um, and we will also film a series of monologues from Theatre of Sanctuary mm. for migrants and refugees. It's, it's an incredible programme of work and we're so lucky at Norwich Theatre to have you leading this for us and, and Thank you. this 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 episode of the podcast has been about theatre makers and, and you're you're engaging such a diverse range of different voices in making theatre. I think diversity is one of the first things we probably spoke about when yeah, we spoke about my job. That's right. Um, diversity is such an important issue in this age, I think, you know, the, the society is so diverse. Norwich City mm. is so diverse. And I think until I started to work on these projects, I had no idea mm. about the diversity of our city and our region. And, and I think that's the importance that we bring diverse communities together and, and somewhere along the project, Maybe it's that they, they not only have their own voices, but they start to listen to other people's voices. Yeah. And then that's where the inspiration and compassion comes in. Abs absolutely. Mish, for everyone listening, I think some of this work is created in that safe space, but over time sure. we'll be able to platform some of this. And it's so wonderful to, to have you that. as part of the team. You've been a an artist and, and theatre maker in Norwich. Aligned to us, and now to have you part of the team is just wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you for what you pleasure. bring to theatre in our city. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on World Theatre Day, and a huge thank you to my two guests, the amazing Darren Brown and the equally amazing Michelle Montague. We'll be back with you again for another episode in April when we'll be talking to two women who've been pioneering their own roles in the industry. The first is the comedian, performer and writer Susie Ruffle, and the second, as always, is a member of our Norwich theatre team, Tara Claxton, our stage manager and theatre operations manager. 
Look forward to talking to you then.